Welcome to the Cloud Pod, where the forecast is always cloudy. We talk weekly about all things AWS, Google, and Azure. We are your hosts, Justin, Jonathan, and Peter. Episode 16, recorded on March 28th, this week in the Cloud Blob. Good evening, guys. It's Thursday after Amazon Summit. We have a big show for you guys tonight. We, but first of all, let's talk about what we're drinking this fine evening. Peter, what's on the table tonight? I had to do something different for the show, so I went with Tequila Rocks. Uh, I actually did mix it up tonight as well. I went with a lovely Corona with lime. Uh, it sounded refreshing on this lovely day. Uh, and then how about Jonathan? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to mention, Jonathan is out tonight. He uh, apparently was lifting a keg and might have hurt his back inadvertently, which is very in character for Jonathan. But we have brought a fantastic guest host on tonight to help fill that gap. And I'd like to introduce our guest, Christopher Short. Hi, I'm drinking Diet Coke. And I'll take my check and leave. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm Chris Short. Uh, I work at a Red Hat on the Ansible team. I'm also a CNCF ambassador. I write the newsletter DevOpsish, and uh, probably see me around the Twitters uh, at Chris Short. Yeah, we uh, we did a little bit of uh, advertising with you guys a couple weeks ago to get some some word and buzz out there. It was really great. So we we're super excited that you agreed to come on the show as well. It's, you know, it's always good to support the newsletters and all the community out there in the DevOps space. All right, well, let's just jump right into it. So uh, yesterday was, of course, Amazon's first summit of 2019. This kicks off summit season, as they like to call it, at, at AWS. And they had a slew of announcements, some of them in the keynote with uh, Mr. Warner Vogels, and some of them during the Twitch live stream. That was, it's sort of a weird choice they make, actually, around that, because if you're at the event, you're not watching the Twitch live stream, so you're not actually finding out about the announcements. Um, and so it's, it's almost kind of a mixed, op missed opportunity on their part. But... Um, yeah, I, I was able to capture them all for you, so we will talk about all of them. Let's just jump right into it with the first one. Uh, Amazon multi-account support for Direct Connect Gateway. So instead of having to now install a Direct Connect Gateway onto every account that wants to access your Direct Connect, you can now manage it one Direct Connect Gateway for up to 10 accounts in the same payer organization. Uh, and this is a nice improvement to simplify your world if you're using Direct Connect. More areas where we're getting to one network uh, when we're using accounts for blast radius, but we want one network. So keep going this direction. Yeah, I, but it is slightly easier for people. So I'm kind of okay with this. I've never been a fan of the whole account organization, the whole scheme, but you know, this is better. So I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, we talked about it a couple of times, but you know, the different schemes between Azure and Google and, and Amazon and you know, both Azure and Google being, you know, second and third to the market have a much better multi-account story than Amazon does. But, you know, Amazon's trying to fix this problem. I'm glad to see the investments. Yep. Uh, Dr. Matt Wood on stage announced the new Amazon Deep Learning Containers. Uh, this simplifies your machine learning needs by providing a pre-built container with TensorFlow, MXNet, and PyTorch. Um, you can use this with, of course, Kubernetes, uh, ECS, and EC2-based Docker images. Um, it's interesting to me because it, it just looks like a container to me, but it does not seem to be available on premises, uh, but maybe that's coming in a future release. Yeah, I didn't know what to make of this one. Uh, it's kind of like, okay, I, I think there's something else behind this potentially. It seems like it's sort of an extension of what they announced at reInvent, which was the you know pre-built EC2 instances with the deep learning components kind of built into them in advance. and. Even when they announced that at reInvent, I sort of felt like, why is this just a container? So it, it is a little interesting. It does feel like there's another shoe going to drop on this one. I totally agree with you. AMD processors, which were announced at reInvent, are now GA'd. And uh, I spent some time at the AMD booth where they were trying to tell me how I could save 10% or more on my instances. These are available in six different sizes, all powered by AMD. Uh, and you know some of the benchmarks I've seen in the past show they're pretty pretty comparable to their Intel friends and for 10% less maybe that's a great savings for a lot of companies. We look back at when uh, Intel brought out the Pentium and changed their whole branding model so that they could um, build that brand and build the Intel inside brand. And uh, why did we care about that? It was probably buy the best you wanted to buy. You wanted to ensure compatibility and and reliability. And now that we have the cloud, it's kind of like. What's my dollars per MIP is really what we care about. Yeah, who cares when everything's got Spectre and Meltdown vulnerable, right? Like, it's not like you're getting a huge value add by spending a few more dollars. It's sort of interesting, though, because at the summit, uh, everything is, you know, sponsored by Intel. The, you know, the Deep Lens, uh, Deep Racers are all from Intel. You know, Intel sponsoring all these booths. 
uh, Intel, you know, had a video play before the main summit keynote started. And, you know, then AMD here, you know, we're going to, we're going to reduce the cost by 10% and we're going with AMD, you know, for these new instance types. And it's sort of interesting choice, uh, you know, how prominent Intel is featured at these events than to have AMD just kind of swagger on in there and say, oh, well, you get the same thing, but for 10% less, it's interesting marketing juxtaposition, if you will. Well, I think it's also AWS telling Intel, like there are other options out there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Go, go back to when Workspaces was released. Yeah, and it was uh, I think what the main diamond sponsor back then was Citrix. Yeah, but Citrix, uh, you know, they're getting in money from them in other ways until the uh, at least until the Nitro hypercoilers came out. But, uh, hmm. It is definitely interesting, and I, I'm glad to see it though. I definitely it's a good you know Spectrum meltdown uh, pricing pressure opportunity for Amazon to have you know options and to give you different things, and there are there are advantages to the AMD processors and some workflows, and some work cases. So. Uh, it's nice. I'm glad to see it. I, I'm still more excited about the ARM processors than I am about the AMD. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're still early days of ARM, so but we'll see where it goes. Amazon did GA, their Glacier Deep Archive. Uh, so this is ability to store your data on the cheapest storage available at something like 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 8 cents per gigabyte. Uh, basically works out to be, I think, about a dollar per terabyte of storage. Uh, you can retrieve this data in about 12 hours or less, so it's definitely not quick <laughs> if you need the data back. Uh, but it does store all of the typical Amazon S3 actions like versioning, tagging, uh, lifecycle management, etc. And you can also now use this with the storage gateway if you want to use uh, deep tape archive backups. Uh, so if you are doing some type of VTL type solution on premise or even in the AWS for some reason, uh, you can now point this to your Amazon storage gateway and get the advantage of this Glacier deep archive. Uh, for offsite backup. So nice solution for those of you still stuck with Iron Mountain who want something better. Uh, this is something to definitely take a look at. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of the car industry. You know, you have the uh, you have your, your entry-level car, and then year after year, you add little bells and whistles, make it a little bit bigger, give it a little more power, until eventually you need a, you need another entry-level car. So you create your new, uh, your new car model that goes back to where you started. Uh, this, this value prop, sounds a lot like the original uh, Glacier, uh, just obviously now at a much, much lower price point. But I think I, you look at like banks who pretty much are afraid to delete anything ever. How great when you just start looking at the dollar per terabyte number to deal with data that you may never touch again. Yeah, it's interesting because you know in some areas of real estate, uh, you have to store documentation for life of loan. And when you think about a, a loan that's going to be lasting for 40 years on a house, uh, to have to store that in primary you know, SSD or even S3 storage, that's really a not effective cost management tool. And so this is, this is a fantastic long-term storage. It gives you the compliance you need, the durability you need, but at the fraction of the dollars you need. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Or lawyers who, you know, law firms who have to uh, effectively store their case files forever because there's always a reason why statute of limitations didn't run out because it didn't start because of some case. So you just have to store everything forever. Uh, the next one that they announced, uh, AWS App Mesh is now GA. Uh, this was also another reInvent uh, preview release. Uh, this is the service mesh solution or app mesh solution to handle communication between containers and EC2 instances. Um, this is really Envoy under the hood, if you're familiar with Envoy in any way. Uh, it's so it can handle proxying to and from the EC2 instances, handle the routing and the, the layers between your ECS nodes and EKS nodes. And you know, as a no, number of services grow within an application, it becomes more difficult to pinpoint exact location of errors or to reroute that traffic after failures and safely deploy code changes. And this is a ni really nice solution to kind of simplify that entire ecosystem. I am like, this is a feature that I'm very excited about. Um, I mean, just service messages in general, but taking that and extending it further and further into the cloud, right? going across ECS, Fargate, EC2, and then you can put your generic Kubernetes instances as well in it. Um, that kind of gives you the best of all worlds wherever your workloads may be. You can now put them in your service mesh. Yeah, how much have you uh, used service mesh in the past? Uh, me personally, not too much, but I've seen some very, very interesting applications of it being used, and it's amazing to watch like just failures and just traffic just moves around and done. Um but then, you know, when you think about all the regions that they put this in, if you could figure out the multi-region service mesh application and really kind of figure out, uh, you know, it turns that HA model into, you know, milliseconds, not 
potentially seconds or minutes. Being from a network background, I've always sort of, you know, watched the SDN space. And while I think SDN is really interesting, um, it doesn't really ever deliver what I really wanted. So service mesh is really what I thought SDN should always be. And mm -hmm. so I, I'm super excited about these technologies. I'm not using them yet either in production, but, you know, we definitely have been talking about, you know, service mesh and potentially even something like... Um, a console directed proxying layer, right? Where, you know, as a nodes come up and down that it gets routed and proxied through a console layer. Um, there's a lot of really interesting things that happen in the network space that are, I'm really glad to see these enhancements. Um, and Envoy is a great solution. And, you know, if you can connect this to your on-premise world or to other clouds, it really does simplify some of that multi-cloud story. Would you say that the rush to move to con a container-based deployment model is sort of forcing um, the development of these services? I wouldn't say that. I would say these services are forcing the rush to container development, to be honest with you. Ooh, I like that. Um, I mean, that's just, I mean, that's my personal opinion, obviously. But I, when you look at something like Istio, uh, it's like, wow, uh, I want that and I want that now. I can get all this data out of something I don't have to rewrite uh, necessarily. So, yes, people want to jump to that as soon as they can. I mean, I think it's just a continuing march down this path of everything is code. And, you know, I, I think it does help simplify use cases for people to adopt containers faster. And I, I, I sort of agree with that opinion um, because these are challenges that you run into very quickly if you're dealing with um, any amount of containers at scale. It's like, how do you start doing routing? How do you get segmentation? How do you provide the security boundaries that you really need? Um, so this is definitely very early days for this service, but I am super excited to see what they announce over the next 12 months for App Mesh. I think we're going to see a lot of really cool enhancements. Let's move along to uh, Concurrency scaling for Amazon Redshift. Uh, so basically, you know, if you're using Redshift for your BI database in the back end, uh, there, you know, and your BAs or business analysts are trying to do long-running data sets or data workloads or data science, um, you potentially will have situations where your Redshift uh, database can't handle that peak capacity need. And so there's been two solutions in the past to do that: you either over-provision to meet your peak, which is a cloud anti-pattern. Um, or you optimize for typical workloads and your peak workloads suffer, which is not always a great user experience. Uh, so Amazon has now released concurrency scaling, which I don't know why, they don't, why this is not just called auto scaling for Redshift, <laughs> but this is additional processing power available to you in seconds uh, and does not need to be pre-warmed or pre-provisioned. You only pay for what you use and you accrue this very similar to what you do on a T2 or T3 instance series with uh, instance credits. So the longer the, the Redshift cluster is running and not being used, the more credits you earn, and then you burn them down when you have those peak loads. Uh, when the performance is needed and or is not needed, the capacity is then removed from the cluster and you don't pay for it anymore. So this is really nice. Again, it's I think it's auto-scaling for Redshift, but I think uh, they were trying to change the name because auto-scaling makes it sound like it's ephemeral and you don't want your Redshift data to be ephemeral. Uh, but, you know, I, they probably could have come up with something a little bit better, but that's my take. Yeah, it's an odd name. I will give you that. I, I wish they could have maybe said, uh, you know, like hot standby or something, but maybe that's too old school potentially now. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Redshift has always been a very server full sort of architecture and technology. And so when you're in that model, you are paying for what you provision, not for what you use. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm trying to... Uh, architect this in my head and figure out how their cost model matches this. Um, yeah. How, how it matches their pricing model or their pricing model matches their architecture, which um, I don't know if I figured it out quite yet, but uh, I think it's one of the big misses in Redshift as compared to, you know, looking at uh, uh, BigQuery. So this will, this definitely is taking them in the right direction. I mean, column in our databases have always been super CPU heavy and super intensive and, you know, I, I just see it clearly as their answer to solving this anti-pattern. And, you know, th there was very similar things done with Dynamo, right? You know, so Dynamo came out, you had to, you know, it was dynamic at first, then you had, you know, provision IOPS for read and writes, and then they put a caching layer on top of that, and then they eventually gave you auto-scaling for read and write IOs. I sort of wonder now if Redshift's kind of on that same path, and this is the beginning step of, you know, a multi-step path towards a more cost-effective, more modular version of uh, columnar database. Um, so I, I, it's definitely a nice improvement, though, and I, I definitely see customers using this. And we talked last week about Azure's uh, priority processing for, you know, your CEO came in and wants to run his, you know, sales report. Uh, it doesn't want to be slowed down by the data processing for everyone else. Um, this is actually a better answer, I think, than to that. So I, I'm glad to see 
um, a more cloud-friendly option than what Azure released last week. Moving right along, ALB request routing for HTTP customer headers. Now, I know Jonathan's not here, but Jonathan is super stoked about this one. Hmm. Uh, so being able to do advanced routing requests based on any custom HTTP header um, really allows you to do a lot more flexibility in how you route traffic. So if you wanted to route traffic for, say, you know, a specific customer or A-B testing or for blue-green deployments, you can now do that at the header level versus having to deploy a whole different infrastructure or a whole different routing rule and provision that to your ALB and take that potential downtime risk. Um, it also supports multiple ands and ors, uh, so you can have more complex rules in the new ALB routing. Um, so overall, this is a really great enhancement that really opens up a lot of really great ALB use cases. And, and ironically enough, it was announced the same day that they had F5 on stage uh, announcing the F5 cloud package or a program or platform, whatever that is. Uh, so a little funny because this is a direct attack on Nginx and F5, which uh, was on stage. You know, you look at ALB and um, all I could think about, because we do a lot of migrations and oftentimes you get uh, people dependent upon tools like F5 and the proprietary features there for load balancing. And um, it's a major sticking point where they'd like to go to a cloud native service and they can't. So they're using network appliances running on instances, which is definitely suboptimal from a network standpoint. And uh, um, I guess now it's just looking at this and saying, are there enough features where people, when they migrate, can go direct to ALB? Um, or are there still application transformations that they have to do uh, prior to moving? Yeah, I, having participated in a lift and shift kind of operation that involved a very, very uh, old, uh, not old, but just uh, <laughs> long installed and used F5, uh, having more options for ALBs would have made this uh, this particular migration a lot easier. It's definitely a problem I have right now, so I, <laughs> I'm very glad to see this. So, are there are there enough features? Do you think there are enough features to get you over the hump? I mean, this is definitely a big one that we were missing. Um, in one of our routing patterns, we use a custom HTTP header to determine uh, a specific pod that we use for one of our applications. Um, and this was a lack, you know, so we were talking about trying to change the methodology that we use to do that routing. But, you know, the Delaware team is like, well, it works fine on the F5. Why am I going to do this? Uh, and now we can say, well, we don't need you to do it. We can just use the header that you already have. Right. Which, yeah. Uh, it's a much better mm -hmm. story. So I do think it has value. I do think it's something customers are going to use very quickly and are going to get value out of. I, there are still ALB enhancements that need to come before it really can kill an F5 fully. But, you know, it's a step in the right direction. And I'm always happy about steps in the right direction. Hey everyone, Jonathan here. I just wanted to take a minute to thank the cloud consulting gurus at Foghorn for helping make the cloud pod possible. These folks truly get it. Cloud consulting experts since 2008, they are premier tier partners with AWS, Google Cloud Platform Silver, and Microsoft Azure partners. From multi-cloud to containers to moving full production workloads to the cloud under the tightest compliance, Foghorn's team of full stack cloud engineers have been there, done that, gotten the t-shirt, and are ready to share their experience with you. If you're in the market for some talent to supplement your team, visit www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod www.fogops.io slash the cloud pod foghorn the promise of cloud delivered amazon transfer for sftp is now supporting vpc and private link and if you'd ever if you listen to our reinvent episode you know that we were pretty incredulous that this product did not support either of those on announcement <laughs> uh as well as you know didn't have security groups which they've also now resolved with this with you can now put an nlb in front of your sftp server to allow customers to whitelist and to do some security grouping there um, so definitely nice improvements there. There were the ones that I was really mad that were not there on announcement. So I'm glad to see the SOTP service continuing to improve. Yes, yeah, just another one. This is the most painful thing for many companies because they're like, I'm happy to transform. I don't need FTP anymore, but I've got 50 of my partners or customers or whoever, and that's all they know, and that's all they have, and we have to keep it. Yep. <laughs> Like financial industry, I remember uh, we were still using a lot of regular FTP when I was you know, working in the news industry in the 20-teens, right? Like 2010, 2011. So, yeah, SFTP was like 
the preferred thing and s3 was obviously like oh boy that's gonna be a bridge too far right now uh, this is literally something i was talking with uh, peter actually about at one point about how do we build this SRTP to s3 bridge <laughs> right and you know we had, we had designed you know this whole terrible thing with s3 sync and all these other crazy <laughs> oh, God. you know you know terrible solutions but it would it was going to work and then you know they announced this and we're like oh, oh god we don't have to do that project thank anymore. god yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was a bullet dodged <laughs> totally it cracks me up because people are like, oh, are you bummed? You don't get to build that? That's business for you? I'm like, that, that's the last thing I want to build. So many more exactly. fun things to build. Yeah. Yeah, that's what everyone wants to build is, you know, the antiquated technology from 30 years ago back in the cloud. It's, it's always fun. Yeah. So Amazon Toolkit for IntelliJ uh, has now been GA'd as well as a new Visual Studio Code version is now in preview. Uh, this is, if you're using the SAM architecture for Lambda functions, this is a integration directly into your IDE of choice uh, to allow you to create new and ready to deploy serverless applications uh, right from your IDE that go into Lambda. Uh, so this is fantastic. Uh, nice to see them trying to meet developers where they live and where they code uh, as, you know, as much as they want cloud nine to be that place, you know, developers don't like change. So I'm, I'm super glad to see, you know, them starting to expand. I am hoping for maybe sublime text as a, a choice here soon in the future or Vim, but uh, I do think someone on stage mentioned that Vim is not an option. So we'll see. There is a Vim plugin for visual studio code. I am a fan of it. Oh, is there? I did not know that. Mm -hmm. Join the club. That Come out. on now. I'll check that out. There's a lot. Of, there's actually a ton of great plugins. So it is very good to see more people bringing stuff to uh, the IDEs that are out there right now. Yeah, I, I definitely. Um, you know, you go to the big ones, and then from there you go to the smaller ones, and eventually everyone gets happy. And or some other people look at the code and the Visual Studio Code, for example, is out there already. Right. Um, that's not very hard to take a Visual Studio Code plugin and port it to Sublime Text or to um, some of the other tools out there. So that's. Definitely a possibility that we'll see those start to happen more often here in the future. Um, yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the huge uh, areas where nobody thinks about how difficult it would be to do your l local development and testing and just sort of keep your, your velocity up without having to always get stuck and have to send something to the cloud to do some quick tests and to make sure you're going down the right path. So these tools are super cool. I think and it just totally bridges the gap and makes makes it a no-brainer for developers to want to go this way. Amazon EKS has now opened a public preview for Windows containers. Um, this now is uh, Kubernetes 1.11, which added Windows support is now supported by EKS. Uh, you can now go in and use this to validate performance and stability of Windows containers. Uh, but personally, I would recommend you not do Windows containers. They're still not really containers. They're massive in size. Uh, they're very hard to scale. They're very difficult to do a lot of things with. But if your application was, you know, can use the containerization of Windows, and that's the only way you can get there, then you know, so be it. But I, I think .NET Core is a better choice for this one personally. But you know, if this is what you have to do, then. Amazon now supports you. Yeah, I try to steer people away from full-blown uh, any OS, uh, <laughs> you know, in a container. But, uh, yeah, the preview edition I'd be a little leery of here in this case. Uh, but the good news is uh, Kubernetes that just GA Windows containers. So if you have to use them, the real production use cases are coming. I still have yet to see the really compelling Windows container use case that you couldn't solve with just going to .NET Core on top of Linux or Alpine Linux or anything else that's not Windows. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't mind .NET, but the, the overhead of the Windows container is just so massive. Oh. I mean, like the smallest image I've gotten, I think, is five gigabytes in size. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not a container. That's, that's a, a DVD. That's, <laughs> it's like yeah. a Blu-ray. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's a VM in a box, man. Yeah, just push Vagrant that's images around to be easier. <laughs> It'd be faster too. Well, ECS uh, now supports local testing, uh, so you can now leverage an open source container to test your applications locally before deploying to ECS. This uh, container provides you the task metadata service as well as test credentials that you can now validate. Uh, and this repo uh, allows for rapid iteration loops to occur on your laptop before having to try to provision your container in ECS. Um, this is super nice, and this is something that I know has been a big complaint for people who are using uh, Kubernetes, and where you can run Kubernetes on your laptop today, and you know, 
test it right there, but you couldn't do that with ECS. So this this eliminates a barrier to ECS adoption. And I'm a big fan of ECS. Uh, I like Kubernetes as well, but uh, ECS is just simpler and less headache for so many, many workloads. So I always prefer ECS, but uh, for people who were you know, needing this solution, this is here for you today. Yeah, I always tell people to try to go with a vendor solution and try not to roll your own Kubernetes, but people rarely listen to me on that and then learn the hard way. But what they always missed was, hey, why can't I do stuff locally and, you know, and just like literally flip a switch and it be in prod or, you know, some kind of environment. And yes, this is a nice addition. And uh, shout out to Corey Quinn. Uh, I am winning the develop locally, not in the cloud battle so far. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, develop locally is definitely the way to go, in yes. my opinion. So I'm, I'm on your camp on that one. Yeah, totally agree. And then uh, our, our last big announcement from the, the summit was uh, Amazon Fargate and ECS now support external deployment control. And so this is a new set of APIs for task sets. Uh, task sets allow you to basically declare the versions of the container definitions you would like to be running in your service. Uh, and you can now have multiple tasks in a service in this task set. Uh, so you can now basically roll this out uh, in more blue-green deployment method or whatever. Uh, versus the old way you had to do it, you had to actually deploy a second service uh, with a new container definition. Then you have to do some type of routing with ALB to route between this service to the other service. And it was all very much orchestrated by you uh, through whatever orchestration engine you were using. Uh, but now this is all available to you right out of the box with the new task set management API. So this is uh, super nice, especially if you're a big Fargate user um, or ECS user. This is a pain that you know quite well, and this is a great solution for that. Making things easier for people to deploy is always better. Indeed. Uh, since, you, since you're on the Ansible team, how, how much support does Ansible have for ECS? I've never tried to use it for that purpose. For ECS? I assume, um, yeah. I mean, we, we're not developing those modules. AWS would be. Uh, I don't know if they... Let me check. I'm sure there's something out there, at least community-written. I'm sure, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure someone's told me I can do it before. I just, I, I, I don't use Ansible as much as others do. Right. So, so yeah, like the, the, the appeal of like switching to Ansible for something like that, I don't, I, I be honest with you, I don't know, uh, would be the best use case for it. But if you already had Ansible and you want to just continue using it for your things, yes, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, there's all kinds of ECS bits in awesome. here for Ansible. That's great. So, yeah, have fun with uh, Ansible and uh, let's see, who wrote these? Maybe I can tell you. <laughs> Uh, Mark Chance. So they are community supported. Cool. Awesome. That's great. Uh, and then uh, a couple other things uh, of note from the summit. Uh, they did release episode number two of Now Go Build. Uh, this is the Singapore episode, apparently. We will talk about that more in depth next week. We'll do a quick review of it as we did on the first one when it announced at reInvent. Uh, but overall, the summit uh, was you know, typical summit. Very lightweight. Uh, you know, a few announcements here and there scattered through. Uh, you know, it was good to connect with people like Corey and, and my other friends uh, from the Amazon community, uh, as always. I actually missed you, Peter. I, I looked for you a couple times. I knew you were there. I, I saw your brother more often than I saw you. It happens. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was a good event overall. What was uh, your opinions of the summit overall? I think I'm starting to get to the point where I'm, uh, I'm getting numb to those events. I've been to so many of them. Uh, so it was, it was sort of as expected, I'd say. Um, but it was good to catch up. It, one thing I love about those now is that the community, especially in the in the San Francisco Bay Area here, um, you can't you can't sit down in a public place and have a meeting without six people walking by and wanting to jump in and, and say hi. It's been super fun to get to see uh, current customers, ex customers, um, partners, everybody just popping around. So that part is super fun. Chris, did you make it out to the summit, or did you just watch from afar? Uh, I watched on Twitter from afar. <laughs> nice. How was the uh, How was the remote experience? Um, I mean, it wasn't bad. Uh, it, so Twitter is always just kind of a constant thing in the background that I can switch on and off. Uh, I picked up on the things that I wanted to, right? So th that's what's important to me. Um, so <clears throat> it wasn't I, just it wasn't terrible. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't great wasn't terrible very impressed anything uh you guys were hoping for that didn't get announced oh um mm. price cuts more price cuts i would like to see some of the prices for uh just you know bandwidth in general start to come down between regions a little bit faster 
Yeah, that's definitely an area we talked about here on the podcast a few times. That that's, you know, <laughs> I'm so glad you have 55 price cuts, but can you can you cut the one that actually the one that matters the most? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great. I'm so glad you you know changed the price of that thing I don't use. Uh, but can we talk about the bandwidth charges? Uh, I was actually uh, hoping to finally see the long promised um, EKS version of Fargate. I was hoping that would maybe make its uh, debut here at the summit, but maybe yeah. it'll come up in a future summit. I I continue to see where the dust settles with Kubernetes and AWS and everything. So yeah, I'm patiently waiting. All right, good. Well, let's move on to uh, non-summit news because uh, there was a lot of other things happening in the space. Uh, we have a couple still AWS items that got released over the weekend, but uh, let's start with the first one. So Amazon has apparently made a change to the way they're going to handle uh, new regions coming out from a security perspective. So new IAM permissions and roles were established that um, will make new regions deny by default. So the new regions, Hong Kong, Bahrain, Cap Town, and Milan, um, will all be uh, disabled by default and will have to be enabled uh, by your administrators. They have some new IAM actions to control these enablement and disablement capabilities, and they have modified the power user access policy if you're using the managed power user access policy uh, to now have this permission removed, as well as this is now supported in SCP, uh, which allows you to restrict this at the organizational level. So uh, as a company that is US centric, <laughs> that does not want any of our data in any <laughs> other regions, uh, I am super happy about this particular change. Um, I am slightly disappointed that they didn't retroactively make this available to other regions. I mean, I, I honestly don't want them to go turn them off, but it'd be nice if they would let me go turn them off now that this capability exists. And so um, that's my one complaint about this announcement. I am happy about it for future, but I'd like you to also make this available to the past regions as well. Yes, yeah. I imagine there's a significant amount of technical debt in this, so that's why it's new only right now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my take as well. I, I you know anything when you get into the organizations and the IAM mm -hmm. world, you're you're talking about a lot of really old code. Uh, and a lot of, you know, maybe bad decisions that were made a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we should be able, you, we would, I'd hope that absolutely disabling regions wouldn't be the only way to control resource use in those regions. But the, uh, um, it is amazing how many times you'll be like, why is there a bill where it is? And you check everything and you find out someone, someone was like, yeah, I was getting tired of getting stepped on. So my method of partitioning, since I don't have my own account, was to go find a region that, no, that, that nobody else was using. And I just started using that for my testing, and then I left it up and running. Well, that's a great scenario. Yeah, like use the most expensive one too, please. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah exactly. Find one that has the bad exchange rate. <laughs> um, yeah, my experience with that was I had a, a security engineer who went on vacation uh, to India and was messing with Kali Linux and had deployed a couple of Kali Linux boxes in India region and uh, then forgot about them or he was still on vacation and then uh, our security team detected that in some way and <laughs> that was a big security incident also and someone's running Kali Linux from India and it happened to be our own people which was great but <laughs> yeah. it, was, Thank it was a great fun story. <laughs> Thank goodness it's not, yeah, it could be That's so the much most worse. like IT security story ever I think. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, totally. Uh, we, we like to give him crap about that occasionally when uh, we're talking about other security things. But remember, remember that time you, you deployed Kali Linux in India? And, uh, <laughs> Forgot yeah, about got, it. Got a lot of people yeah. upset. Yeah, <laughs> super great. Uh, all right. Uh, Google uh, has released some new SRE tools and training. So, uh, you know, everyone kind of assumes that, or takes for granted that Google is basically the company that invented SRE, them and LinkedIn. Um, and so they're you know, on a mission to make it easier for SaaS companies in particular to adopt SRE principles and practices. Um, they've been spending a lot of time apparently with SaaS companies and they learned a few common things about SaaS companies. Most SaaS companies, for example, are in early stages of their SRE journey, which I can vouch for is very true. Mm -hmm. uh, customers want to be able to build these SLOs very quickly and effectively. And reliability, of course, goes beyond defining and monitoring metrics. Um, so to address these, they've announced three new things, uh, well, really two. Uh, one is a new Coursera co online course. Uh, so this allows you to basically take an online course that'll teach you the ways of the Google SRE. Uh, and also a new tool to help SaaS customers identify SLO targets. Um, this is available right now to SaaS ISV partners of Google, and I'm hoping this will become available to all, everyone because it's not just SaaS companies who have SLOs. Um, but, you know, it sounds like they're starting a SaaS and they're going to expand that from there. But uh, really nice to see them investing in, you know, making other companies 
you know, drink the Asari Kool-Aid. Yeah, I appreciate everybody's, uh, I want to say everybody, like all the major vendors that are now starting to like roll their own training to help people out because I, one of the things I see, at, at least in the Ansible world, is just uh, sometimes a lack of imagination, you know, when it comes to like, especially automation, uh, you know, what can I glue together? So having some training that gives you kind of the foundational stuff to, you know, kind of open your mind to these things from the people that are the experts is very handy, especially when it's, hey, really cheap or free. It must drive them nuts when they get customer complaints that they're not getting their money's worth or, or they don't like their their workloads running on the cloud. And then they're like, okay, let's see what you're doing. And, and they're just doing things. Just what else could you possibly do wrong? I can't think of anything <laughs> <Yeah>. else. <laughs> so get them trained up to use the tools right, use the platform right. Well, and I, I hope that this is also their attempt to try to prevent SRE from getting really bastardized. Um, you know, if you think about what's happened to DevOps as a concept and, you know, it's a manifesto, but then that turned into DevOps roles, DevOps teams, uh, different implementations of DevOps. You know, is it release management or is it release automation? Is it something else? Um, you know, you know, I've always kind of seen SRE as an implementation of DevOps principles. Um, and so, you know, I like the fact that they're trying to get a front of that before a bunch of companies who don't know what they're doing make SRE just into a super knock again. <laughs> and so I, I definitely appreciate their efforts to try to standardize on what SRE is and really educate people on this thing versus the DevOps community, which, and I love the DevOps community, uh, but, you know, they, they didn't really go do anything more than the manifesto and let all these companies just bastardize the crap out of it. Yes, I'm very... Uh sad of kind of like what happened to like everybody wants uh devops like the the things of devops the outcomes of devops they want to do the things that go into devops but they don't want to call it devops anymore so i think i thought it was really funny when an azure devops came out um like what is this <laughs> is this <laughs> well, is this a unicorn it, what is this <laughs> yeah and, and actually it, it's a, you know we've talked about azure devops a couple times you know, it's a great set of products, but it is a terrible it's name. It's a terrible name. <laughs> and, like, I did some yeah. digging for my newsletter when they released it. And I've still got, like, a stack of sticky notes from, like, just calls and talking to people at Microsoft. And it's like, every person I talked to, no one wanted to call it this. So I was like, okay, well, fun. <laughs> Enjoy. I mean, it is still better than TFS. Absolutely. <laughs> <So>. But, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it could have been so, so is SVN. Better, but, uh... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to check out this Coursera course. Um, I've read through the DevOps, uh, or the, sorry, the SRE book from Google a couple times. Um, and I, I'm going to check out the course. I'm going to see what it's all about. But um, definitely glad to see this. And if you're interested in doing SRE in your organization or company, you know, definitely check out the SRE book. It's free on the internet as well as this course. Uh, and, and learn what it is before you just go and say, we're creating an SRE team. Please, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't change your sysadmins to SREs. Actually have them like, trained to do this stuff. Uh, Azure has released new capabilities for the hybrid cloud. Uh, so this is a bunch of updates to the Azure Stack uh, HCI solution. Uh, there's now more customer options to buy this from Dell, uh, from the Dell EMC Tactical Microsoft Azure Stack, mm -hmm. which uh, is now G8, as well as the new data box edge capabilities, which allow you to, it's basically Lambda at the edge, uh, but with a terrible name. Uh, those are all now available to you to and continue to enhance your hybrid cloud story and your hybrid cloud journey with Azure. So this is a nice improvement if you're using the uh, on-premise versions of Azure and moving workloads between your on-premise data center and your public cloud um, solution. So nice to see these improvements. Nice to see the continued investment. Uh, it seems a little bit of a you know protective mode because they assume Outpost is coming soon. I I almost wonder based on the timing of this if they thought Outpost was going to GA at the summit because it, it came out on uh, Monday right before the summit started. But uh, nice to see. Yeah, I would think that Azure would be uh, ahead of Amazon from a hybrid standpoint just because the Microsoft customers fit so well into that box, the hybrid box. Whereas I could see a lot more pure cloud native companies going aws yeah they definitely always have been uh at the forefront of hybrid that was that was their initial play when they first did asia um they went hybrid so it makes sense and you know that was always the thing about amazon was like oh they're not believing in hybrid they're not going to do hybrid and then they announced outposts at reinvent um reversing you know several years of we're not doing hybrid uh which was, was kind of a big announcement at reinvent but that that product has not seen the light of day yet as far as i know i don't know anybody who's using it but um you know Azure was definitely seemed like they were concerned maybe something was coming out this week, but 
didn't happen. And then the uh, the final news story this week, uh, SCP or Service Control Policies uh, for organizations has now enabled some additional fine grain permissions. Uh, they can now they can now be created and managed from the primary organizational account. So before SCPs had to be linked in this kind of uh, very manual ad hoc way. Uh, and with these SCPs, you can now specify specific conditions, resources, and not actions, uh, which you know is just one new IAM paradigm that I have to learn for SCPs. Um, I wish they would standardize IAM and SCP and this the syntax that they're using across their different permission schemes. But uh, nice to see a more organizational level implementation for service control policies. Yeah, I found the initial response to SCPs and orgs when it came out was, wow, this is perfect. This is going to solve so many problems. And then there, it was so coarse grained that, um, that, that it was very difficult to leverage them beyond very rudimentary sort of these are dev accounts and these are prod accounts. Um, so expanding this capability, I'm excited about these, but more excited about the fact that now it opens the door to potentially um, leveraging that structure to to, uh, to get even more uh, uh, sort of control over all of your accounts from one place. For you, the listeners of the Cloud Pod podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook downloaded with a free 30 day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash the cloud pod. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash the cloud pod for your free audiobook. That's all of our news this week. Uh, let's move on to Lightning Round with Peter. Awesome. All right. Here we go. So, uh, Chris, I don't know if you've been briefed on the rules here. Kind of. Uh, if you hear my dog whining I'll in the go background, through. I apologize. <laughs> uh, I'll go through it very quickly, just to make sure you know. Uh, I tend, uh, I've been given the burden both to uh, read the lightning round as well as uh, um, as to judge it. And Oof. so uh, I can't remember. I can't keep a running total through this thing. So whatever comment catches my ear the most is the winner for the week. So it only takes one. It only takes one. Oh wow! Only takes one. Okay. It only so, takes right. one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you have one really good zinger in there somewhere, you just save that to the time, and then you you lay it out there. And if Peter remembers at the end, you win. Yes. Um, well, we we are we are trying to help him be more democratic about it, but it's failed so far. Yeah, because it's we, terrible. We we end up trying to troll him out on this, or we. You know, we, we try to, you know, make cases for ourselves to win. So it's, it's super fun. <laughs> All right. So uh, new gigabit connectivity options announced for AWS Direct Connect. Where has this been all my life? Really? Gigabit? Is, is it 1999 again? I, I thought we were on to 10 gigabit by now. <laughs> yeah, but for a small enterprise, this is great. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Can I just have 100 megabytes? That's all I want. <laughs> <laughs> you get nothing. <laughs> Uh, AWS config now supports tagging of AWS config resources. About time. <laughs> I, I mean, again, why is this not a part of the product in general? It's like standard. Like, why wouldn't you do tagging in the thing that could tag things? <laughs> Come on. Who? Yeah. It's like who's? Yeah, but who needs to watch? Who's going to tag the? Who's who's going to yeah, tag the taggers? The yes. Who tags the tagger? Um, okay. Uh, now you can use query based. Um, oof, so difficult. Uh, <laughs> this is so, so awful. Uh, basically, I don't even know how to summarize this. AWS uh, config, you, for using that, you can now use query, um, queries, query based queries to query resource config properties. Yeah. Like S, like SQL, right? Yeah, so basically, yeah. You you would like to know how many of your devices are T three mediums? You can now use config to query them, like SQL. Like SQL, like SQL. Yeah. Sure. Could you have explained I mean, that I, any I, worse though? Like, <laughs> yeah. The headline. I could try. That, Wait, I could try. The headline try was really worse. bad, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so one of the tricks of the lightning round is that I 
when I go through the show notes, and you say in the other show notes that we we kind of put some content there to kind of keep us on track as we talk. And then this section is technically Peter's section to handle. And all I do for Peter is I just literally take the headline and then I put it here, and then he literally reads the headline, which is why we have. But this that's not game the where, headline. <laughs> where we we literally try to now change them as he talks uh, because he'll just read them out loud, which is super fun. It's not that but, fun. Uh, but uh, well, it's not fun for you. It's fun for Jonathan and I, which is all that matters. Uh, but you know, so but in this particular case, like the, the headline's not good either. It's now you can query based on resource configuration properties in AWS Config. It do, it just it doesn't work. But the the you know the uh, URL for the blog post is now you can query based on resource configuration properties in AWS Config. And so I I tried to make it better, but you know Peter has no one to blame but himself that he can't follow. I can't this. follow through. <laughs> Um, despite that fact, now that we can use some sort of SQL language um, to query resources, um, that that's a thing. Yeah. So, I mean, this is Amazon's basically trying to make config into a change management database because they, for some reason, refuse to name it CMDB. Like, but that's what... That's really what they want config to be used for is to be a CMDB solution that can do enforcements of certain configuration requirements or tagging <laughs> now that can tag itself. Uh, you know, but it's just, it's, it's a really bad product name. It's a really bad, you know, like definition of what that product should be in the marketplace. And it, it's something that I hope they rectify sometime in the future. Do you think in three years they're going to release the NoSQL version of this tool? <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Okay, Amazon EKS introduces Kubernetes API server endpoint access control. Uh, uh. Yeah, so why do I talk to a, K, a Kubernetes server without kubectl? Like, I don't, I don't understand that. Like, is that a thing people would actually do with Kubernetes? Is you, you talk to the endpoint directly that you then need to put controls around it? it? It just seems like this is a security group to me at the end of the day. It's just sticking it in a VPC. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, okay, sure. Great, woohoo. <laughs> By the way, I, I heard yesterday, and I will blame this on um, someone, but they basically said that kubectl is, is supposed to be called kubectl. Like, wh- when did that become a thing? So, and I, I am not, there's, I'm not in support. There is uh, <laughs> ongoing disputes uh, of the uh, correct definition of kubectl. Um, I said it the right way. I've only heard a cube cuddle. I've never heard cube CTL. I don't. I've think. heard cube CTL. I've heard cube ectal. I've heard cube cuddle. Um, there's a few others I've heard, so I can't remember them. Yeah. Well, as we've as we have taken a stand on AMI versus AMI here, that's AMI. We will have to make a stand on cube cuddle at some point, I guess. Mm. <laughs> but I, I don't know what that stand would be. But I, I don't know that I care enough to die on that hill. Who doesn't like but, the cuddle? Yeah. Who doesn't uh, like a good cuddle? Yeah. But it's not that type of cuddle. It's it's C U T T L E. It's like I don't, I don't even know what that means. You're gonna get this cuddle. <laughs> okay, let's. Cha- how about we change? How about we change it to cube spoon? Ooh, <laughs> ooh. Uh, maybe, maybe you can make a movement. All right. Huh. All right. Next, AWS Code Pipeline adds action level details to pipeline execution history. Uh. uh okay. So wait. <laughs> Why Ads action level? What other level details were there? There was no detail before. No detail. <laughs> None. So it was just, thanks for adding build. detail, right? Like they could yeah, have just thanks said for adding... we added details. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's it, a lot of I mean, extra verbiage in here for no reason. <laughs> as you learn with most announcements from most of these vendors, there's way too much verbiage <laughs> for what it really is. Oh, true. AWS Storage Gateway now supports S3 object locks. I mean, if if no one else is supporting object locks, so I guess Storage Gateway is the first. <laughs> Yay. You wanted a file system. You got a file system. Yeah. Uh, you, you got SFTP too. So yeah. if you sit there long enough, you'll eventually get it. Yeah. Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics now supports AWS CloudTrail logging. If you weren't paying enough money for your cloud trail logs that are doing nothing already, now pipe them through Kinesis to pay three times as much. <laughs> when you have more money than you know what to do with. Ooh. Uh, 
Google now has VMware vRealize automation support for people who don't know what that means. It's a plugin for VMware vRealize so that you can launch and control your Google uh, resources. Way to keep that VMware torch alive. Hold on tight, VMware. Uh, can I launch onto my VMware on AWS from here? <laughs> uh, that'd be that'd be cool. <laughs> Azure Premium Blob Storage is now GA. <laughs> they really stuck with this name, huh? Blob. Just, they they uh, only reason, not I, just Blob. I, I, premium Blob. <laughs> premium Blob. Yes. The extra and then, extra and then, Blob. Yes, yes. <laughs> Bring the blob on. And every time I hear the blob thing, too, I think of that movie. I don't know which one it is. It's black and white, and the chocolate is like taking over the the town. I mean, it's it's older than me, and I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it's that's all I can think about is this oozing blob handling through the town as it takes over. I mean, I get it. It's not like text. It's it's something. It's data. It's okay. Fine. It's Binary gross. and large. Yeah. It's just it's 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 a thing. I mean. <laughs> It's a premium I mean, thing now. A, yeah. It's premium, yeah. I mean, Amazon has S3, which, you know, that's, a, that's not a bad name. I mean, they were the first. And then Google took Object Store, but Azure beat them to market. So why did they choose Blob? Like, they could have had Object Store, and then Google could have Google Blob. But no, no. I have a theory. Azure. I have a theory. Okay. I think it was someone from the SQL Server Group who got to name this, this service. Mm, maybe. I don't know. It's giving me a lot of credit to the SQL Server. Group. Well, that's what they call blobs, right? Binary large objects that they stick yeah, in that, databases. That was, and that came, what I, if I it's mean, MSSQL on the back end? Ooh. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> ooh. That explains a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along from that problem. <laughs> Speaking of blobs, uh, blob storage on Databox is now GA. Uh, I hate everything about... <laughs> so Databox is uh, Azure's version of um, Snowball. <laughs> so you, you order the Databox, and then you put your storage in the blobs, and then you send the Databox back to Azure to get into the premium blob storage. It's, it's a fantastic I've, nested blob. I figured it out. Microsoft is using Silicon Valley for naming. <laughs> oh, so, uh, yeah. Mike Judge is now in charge yes. of all naming at Azure. All the researchers have been hired from Silicon Valley to name Azure products. Yes. Uh, anyways, a moving around. Amazon <laughs> Aurora is now MySQL 5.7 compatible. And it supports GTID uh, based yeah. application. Um, no, this is good. Like, more MySQL is good for everyone. Well, and it's good to see them moving MySQL faster than they moved Postgres because yeah. I think they just got to Postgres 11. So yeah, there you go. I would say troubleshoot your app. Be ready to troubleshoot apps when you move to 5.7. There's a few changes. Yeah. And if you're not already on uh, an Amazon database, prepare for more changes. Yeah. I <laughs> uh, can't get enough of them blobs. Azure Blob Storage Lifecycle Management is now GA. Like I feel like... If you're going to release an S3 like service, like do it all at once, right? Like don't layer it on. Right? Like if you're going to have a service called Blob, put it all out there. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> if you were, if you if your answer to competing with AWS was make sure you have feature parity with AWS first. I don't know that you'd ever catch right? up. It's um, true. So I think they Good point. <laughs> they sort of had to, but uh, So it's a baby Blob. Yeah, no, I, yeah exactly. AWS RoboMaker announces new build and bundle feature that makes it 10 times faster to update a simulation job or a robot. Just in time for Go Go Deep Racer. Yeah. Is anyone going to do that, by the way? Are you going to do that? I have three of them in my office. Oh my People goodness. are excited. We're, we're, trying to get a, we're trying to get a track, actually, too. Hmm. So we'll see. And we're hosting a meetup to see if people come race them. Can, can I come just with like a remote control and see if I can beat everybody's times? You are more than welcome to always come out to visit us. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring a remote control car. If you can keep the remote control car in the track, I, I will be impressed. Right. Alexa for business now lets you create Alexa skills for your org. Alexa, fire my CEO. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, cancel a meeting. <laughs> nice. I got to give it oh. to fire my CEO today, guys. <laughs> All right. Nicely done. That is, that is, that is a winner. So by the way, you're playing for the 
coveted guest spot. So now you have brought the guests up to uh, Tide with Justin and, oh, that's myself, and Jonathan. Uh, and now Peter is still lagging behind with it's one. It's pretty tough to hand yourself to victory. I, I'm uncomfortable with that model. You did it once before. Yeah, that's that's unfair. Like, he shouldn't he shouldn't have to. Shouldn't be allowed to, I would think, right? If you judge exactly, him. right? Well, I mean, he made the rules, so he can choose. And he's reading, right? Like he shouldn't win if you're reading them. Yeah, I mean, right. we'd, we'd like to make it fair for Peter. Can 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 I give him half of my point then? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I always get half a point. That way, I always I just end up <laughs> accumulating more points than everybody, no matter what. Well, uh, due to Jonathan's injury, there is no cool tool this week. Uh, but it's been a fantastic episode, Chris. Thanks for joining us here on the Cloud Pod. Uh, how would people find you if they want to follow up on your your wittiness and cleverness uh, online? Uh, you can find me at uh, chrisshort.net, uh, devopsish.com, and at chrisshort on Twitter. And I do, I do have to say, I, I am a big fan of DevOpsish. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's... I, I read it almost every week, unless I'm on vacation, and then I skip it. But uh, I do enjoy it. And we actually, we do steal some of our cool tool recommendations from you. So we do thank you for uh, letting us know about some cool tools that Jonathan talks about here on the podcast. So no, I do thank you very much. Right there. No, I, I like uh, giving people more exposure to the stuff they've written. So, yeah. Uh, I can't wait to start reading it. And that is The Week in Cloud. We'd like to thank our sponsors, Foghorn Consulting and Audible.com. Subscribe today on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and tweet us your feedback at hashtag the cloud pod. Oh, I hear some, some background. Do you know noise. what that is? It is like a Roomba. freaking hailing outside my door right now. All of a sudden, a, a huge cloud came over, and it's rain what? or hail coming down on, <laughs> on my roof. I'm going to mute when I'm not talking, but you're going to hear that in the background unless it stops here. Oh my wow, Lord. that's awesome. That's rather impressive. It's not my problem. It's Jonathan's problem. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. This is amazing.